Good day. Thank you for having me in uh, in your well. You're not all from the city, are you? But those of you who are, uh, thank you to PGF, which sounds to me like a golf tournament. I don't know about you, but um, <coughs> I want to thank uh, the those involved in PGF for the invitation to be here. Uh, <coughs> you are exploring the issue of what it is to be missional, and I've been asked to in this first presentation literally define what the term missional means, which. I'm actually very happy to be able to do because I'm getting very anxious about the way a lot of the mainstream Christian community is using this term. Uh, it used to be a absolutely blood and fire prophetic call to the church to absolutely recalibrate everything that it was, it was on about. And now it's becoming used uh, almost as the latest buzzword or the coolest kind of add-on program or the, the newest kind of thing that we can keep on doing business as usual, but just kind of include a bit of missional stuff in there somehow. But I'm afraid, folks, that the whole notion of the missional church paradigm is not an add-on. It's not a new strategy. There's not a model. In fact, I've had a number of seminarians contact me saying, my professor wants me to read the shaping of things to come and describe the model of church that you're describing. He said, I've read the book twice now, I can't find any model. We don't have a model, folks. But we think that church, if it's genuinely missional, will grow out of the soil in which it's planted and will take different shapes in different environments. It's not a new model, it's not a new approach, it's not a new style. The whole idea of missional church thinking is a fundamental and prophetic call for the church to orient everything it is doing around the agenda of mission. In other words, of all the practices that the church ought to legitimately be involved in, missional church thinkers believe that mission ought to be the organizing principle of all those things. We don't think that worship is the primary organizing principle, though we think worship is absolutely the mandate of the church. We don't think that the creation of Christian fellowship or community is the organizing principle, though we think that has absolute merit and is important. We don't think even that the, the expression of evangelism is the, the primary or organizing principle, although that is absolutely essential. When we talk about the missional church, we are talking about a church in which worship, community, leadership, evangelism, social justice, theological thinking is oriented around or organized around the fundamental agenda of mission. And mission, though not a biblical term, it's a, a Latin term simply coming from the idea of to be sent or to go. It implies a sense of emission or movement uh, outwards. Missional church thinkers can track their thinking all the way back to Karl Barth, to the Villingen Conference on Mission. Uh, we quote uh, liberation theologians, Leslie Newbegin, David Bosch. Uh, we are indebted to the thinking of groups like the Gospel and Our Culture Network here in the United States, Emergent, uh, Forge in Australia, the Alternative Church Movement, the Mission-Shaped Church Movement, both from the UK. There have been a lot of voices singing in all sorts of corners of the world about how the church needs to orient itself around the organizing principle of mission. And as was mentioned earlier by Dave, those voices are now starting to come together. A chorus is starting to be sounded. But I am anxious, my friends, that you not domesticate the idea of mission, that you not turn it into something which is palatable, which is not dangerous, which is simple and straightforward, and you can just add missional language onto business as usual. The call to be missional, as I said, is a full-blooded call to the complete and utter recalibration of the church around mission. And we need to allow that kind of thinking to do what I believe, and what obviously others in PGF believe, God is calling the church to do. Do you follow? And how do I define it and how do I describe it? I want to suggest to you three fundamental things by way of introduction tonight. If you embrace missional 
church thinking. If you step into the missional paradigm, uh, there will be three things that will happen to you unquestionably. First thing is this, you will see God differently to the way a lot of the mainstream or mainline churches have spoken about him. Second thing is this, you will see the church differently to the way the mainstream or mainline churches have spoken about church. And thirdly, you will see the world very differently to the way in which the church for, for many, many years has talked to us about the world. Uh, I want to talk to you about those three fundamental shifts, and I want to challenge you tonight about the degree to which you're prepared to embrace that kind of shift. Not an add-on, not a new strategy, not a kind of cool look. I'm sick of this whole notion about emergent or mission and it's just about getting tattoos and drinking beer in bars. That's nonsense, folks. It's about style. If it's about style, well, count me out. But if it is about the Church of Jesus Christ, galvanized into a viral movement, sent outwards, propelled into every nook and cranny of, in your case, American culture, for the purpose of lifting up Jesus. And folks, that will require some fundamental shifts in the business as usual model. Missional church thinkers, firstly, see God differently. Missional church thinkers don't buy into the idea that God is up in heaven somewhere calling us to come up to Zion. We don't subscribe to the idea that God lives in First Presbyterian Church, whichever town you might happen to come from. We don't subscribe to the idea of this far and distant God, holier than anything we could imagine, who has separated himself from us and is calling us, calling us, come, come, come on up to Zion, come and worship me. Those of us who've embraced the missional paradigm recognize that all the way through the Bible, from the first page, you discover a God who is not separating himself, lifting himself up and becoming difficult to find, but rather what you have is a God who moves outward and is propelled into the lives of others, and indeed into the universe. In fact, it was David Bosch, the great South African missiologist, who first pointed this out in a book called Transforming Mission. He says, from the very beginning of time, the stories of creation are the stories of God the missionary. God sends out his word into the chaos and order is fashioned. That even in the very act of creating, God, the missionary, sends himself forth. That all the way through the history of Israel, you have a God who is continually chasing after, seeking after, following after, moving forward into the lives of his people. In the garden, he infuses Adam and Eve with his ruach breath. He sends it forth that they might mirror him and uh, his image. Even after they sin and fall and are propelled out of the garden, he follows after them. And the history of Israel is the history of God's constant sentness after those people who continue to disappoint him or betray him. Do you follow? But folks, this is our God, not the temple God. God seems to, to be prepared to actually acquiesce to the desires for temples and for kings and for nationhood. But it's actually the remarkable thing about the history of Israel is this, they don't fully ever understand Yahweh until after they have been dragged into exile in Babylon, do they? That as dreadful an experience it was for God to take his hand off them, as dreadful as it was for Israel to be de decimated and for them to be taken as forced labor into Babylon, they discovered something about Yahweh in Babylon they could never have understood back in Zion, they discovered this, God is in Babylon. They would tell stories of how God is in Nineveh. God is in the very depths of the ocean. They would continue to tell story after story after the exile of the way in which the God of Israel does not live in a temple, does not live on a mountain in Israel somewhere, but our God, the sent God, moves outward and after his people always so that you have one of the greatest contemporary Jewish theologians, theologians Abram Heschel, who writes his majestic work, on Jewish theology, and he has the best title ever. He calls it God in Search of Man. 
That's what we Jews believe, he says, that all throughout the Old Testament, we have a record of God in search of us. And for those of us who are Trinitarians, the magnificent expression of this sent and sending impulse of God is that God the Father sends God the Son to redeem a lost world. And then God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy uh, send the Holy Spirit. But the cycle is not complete until we recognize that God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit send us. As the Father sent me, says Jesus, so I send you. The term that the Villingen Conference uh, first identified for this, the way to describe God, was the Latin term missio Dei. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Lots of people translate it as uh, the mission of God. It does not mean that. Missio Dei is a way of describing the very nature and character of God himself. It is better translated as the missioning God or the God of mission. David Bosch says, you cannot fully appreciate or ever understand the character of the living God unless you see it through the paradigm of mission. Do you follow? And I speak at and used to belong at a charismatic church and I would have people tell me all the time that they were filled with the Spirit of God because they had words of knowledge or they could speak in tongues or they had visions or images. And I say to them, you tell me you are filled with the Spirit of God and the single most fundamental indication of that is that you are a sent one into the world of those who don't yet know Him. You can speak in tongues till the cows come home. You can get your Reformed theology right until the cows come home. You can do all the Presbyterian stuff until the cows come home. But when you're filled with the Spirit of God, if God is the Missio Dei, if God is the sent one, then how can we not be propelled into the world? God does not live in Presbyterian churches or any other churches for that matter. And for us to stand there and to say, welcome to the house of God, for us to dare to suggest that there's something peculiar about this building or this place, my friends, it's a complete and utter aberration of all that the Jews hoped for and all that is fulfilled in Christ, is it not? That at the point at which he gives up the ghost, that there in the temple, in the Holy of Holies, what happens? But that magnificent curtain is rent in two. And now the temple of the living God is not Zion, it's not the temple it's not a cathedral, it's not even a local church building. The temple of the living God is what? This frail, despicable, broken, limited, this is the temple of the Missio Dei. nothing wrong with buildings enjoy them use them they're facilities you've got a car it's just like a car use your car use your computer use your building but remember this my friends the missio day is propelled outward in search of those who have not yet been redeemed the missio day inhabits those of us who have handed the reins of our life over to our lord jesus it is time for us to rediscover what it is not to build a religion named the religion of Jesus, but for us to be purified, transformed, and mobilized by the Missio Dei. The God who is as present in so-called non-religious contexts as anywhere else. This was the mission of Jesus, was it not? To shatter the religious power of Sabbath to shatter the religious power of temple, to dare to claim that every day was God's day and that the temple of God was now residing in the faithful. That Jesus destroys the power of religion 
and invites us to embrace the sent and sending God who like waves or ripples on a pond is ever moving outwards to reach those who've not yet been redeemed. Do you follow? The second thing about missional thinking is this. We see the church differently. We see the God as missio Dei. Well, we see the church as participatio Christi. I don't know about you, but I always figure a doctrine's never worth its salt unless it's Latin. <laughs> we see God differently. We see him as the missio Dei. We see the church differently. We see it as participatio Christi. What is the church? But the gathering of the redeemed ones sent to participate in the work of Jesus in this world, which I think is something that Dave uh, referenced earlier. But what does it mean to be the ecclesia, the called out ones? It is actually to go forth as salt and light in this world, not to huddle, not to gather, and not to pour most of our energies and most of our times and indeed most of our money on serving ourselves or our loved ones. Participate in what Jesus is doing in this world. You will be astonished by what you will discover. Have you ever wondered where we got the term ecclesia from? Why did Jesus use it a couple of times? And why did Paul make so much of it? I mean, it's, it's not a Christian term. It's not invented by Jesus or by Paul. It was a term that was in usage beforehand. They pick it up and they take hold of it. That'll do. That, that pretty much describes what the followers of Jesus will be like. And then Paul adds to that. There's no question about it. But it's very interesting to go back and seek to discover what's the raw material with which they began. Well, the term ecclesia was used in a very peculiar and particular sense. It did describe a gathering. It did describe those who'd been called out to join a particular community out from the mainstream, if you like, certainly had those elements about it, but it was more often than not used to reference a very particular meeting that happened in the ancient Near East in those days. In Jesus and Paul's day, whenever a village got big enough to have to keep its children and livestock safe, it would put a wall around it. And whenever I heard about walled villages, I always used to think of Lord of the Rings, you know, gigantic walls and vats of boiling oil and it was just like a little brush fence I think kept the kids safe kept the animals in at night the entrance to the to the village through the the, the brush fence was called the city gate again don't you think that should be like a big arched kind of thing and very elaborate no it's just an opening in the in the in the brush fence basically in this day and age whenever men got to be and, and you'll have to excuse me ladies but this was almost entirely a kind of a male uh, gathering Whenever men got to be pretty much the age I am now, whenever men who had had children when they were around the age of 20 got to around the age of 40, or a little bit older than that, <laughs> their sons were now at 20, 21, 22. And so what would a man at my, at my age with sons that age do? I would have brought them into my carpentry workshop as soon as they could walk. I would have got them to play with wood chips and wood shavings and sawdust. I would have handed them tools as soon as they could learn how to use them. I would have been training my son to be a carpenter from the moment he could even imagine what life was all about. And when he got to be about the age of 20, I would hand him all of my tools and my workshop and I would say, now son, the business is yours. If you've got a lot of work to do, I'll come in and help. I'm here for advice. But now at the age of 40, 40 something, you would kind of step out of work and hand it over to your sons. You'd hand over the, 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 the sheep. You would hand over the business. It became now your sons and you became, as it were, semi, semi-retired. So what does someone who's retired in Israel at this particular point in history do? Join a country club, play golf? No, I'll tell you what they do. All the guys who've got white in their whiskers would all go down to the city gate and there they would sit and drink and eat and talk but they wouldn't talk about the good old days or while away the days telling jokes or pointless discussions they fulfilled a very peculiar function in the village whenever there was a conflict whenever there was an ethical dilemma 
whenever the village had a, a, a struggle or a challenge that it didn't know how to meet, people would walk down to the city gate and there they would squat in the dirt with their fathers and their grandfathers and their uncles and they would say, fathers of mine, there's a problem in the village. Oh, would say the older men, tell us. Well, the Smiths are fighting with the Joneses because he strangled his pit bull terrier one day. And <laughs> the east side of the village is arguing with the west side. There's a drought that we don't know how to respond to. There's two sons who are fighting over the inheritance of their father. Whatever it might be, you would go down and you would bring it to the elders. And the elders would all scratch their beards. And I've met uh, missionaries to Palestine who've said part of the rules of this, uh, this whole um, experience is that the, no single elder is allowed to just give the answer because that spoils the fun. They're meant to talk about it all day. So you just add enough of a solution to keep the conversation going. And there they would sit at the city gate and they would reflect on what might be done. Are you familiar with a, a situation in the Gospels where a man comes to Jesus and tries to treat him like an elder and says to him, would you tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me? What does Jesus say? He says, who made me an arbiter over you? What he's saying is, I'm not your elder. I don't live in your village. I don't have to deal with your brother. Who, made, who put me in charge of this? And then turns to the crowd and tells them a story. I know you're familiar with this, right? What's the story he tells? The story about a man who has a bumper crop and has now more wealth than he knows what to do with. And faced with this extraordinary dilemma of being rich beyond his imagining, in Jesus' story the man says, I know what I will do. I will tear down my barns and big, build bigger ones and sit back and take it easy. I can eat, drink and be merry. You're not much on nodding when I ask you questions, but you've heard this story before, right? <laughs> Anyone listening to that story would have known immediately what was wrong with it. You see, when a man had a bumper crop and now had more money than he knew what to do with, what's the first thing that man would do? He would go down to the city gate. He would squat in the dirt and he would say, Fathers of mine, I've got more money than I know what to do with. I've had a bumper crop. What, what, what do you men think I should do? And then they'd say, slow down, slow down. We'll, we'll spend the whole day talking about this. And when he came back, they might say to him, have you given some percentage of this to the poor? To, to the poor, okay. Have you given some to the priests to, to maintain the cult? Oh, the priest, yeah. I don't see why you should be blessed and not the whole village. So have you held a fantastic feast and we've all partied? A fantastic feast. And then after he's done all these things, he might go back down to the elders and say, fathers of mine, I've got more money than I know what to do with. And they might say, have you given some to the poor? Yes, I've given, I've given a lot to the poor. But what, what, about, what about to the priest? Yes, I've given some to the priest. But what, what about a big party, a big celebration? Don't you remember? Oh, yeah, they say, actually. <laughs> and maybe now we might conclude that maybe you should pull down your barns and big, build bigger ones. What's the man's sin? The building of the barns? The man's sin that every listener to Jesus' story would have known from the beginning was when he said, I know what I will do. Do you follow? The word that was used to describe the gathering of the elders at the gate was ecclesia. What does the gathering of elders do in a village? What contribution does it make to that society? Listen carefully, my friends. The raw material that Paul takes to then describe what the followers of Jesus would be like 
is he takes a term that describes a group of people who are given the express mission of adding value to the village of which they are part. It is a better village. It is a better town than it could ever be because of the presence of those wise, good, true, loving, older men. Do you follow? Now, Paul adds to that. We're a body, we're a bride, we're called to be unified in our diversity, to to be holy and righteous. He adds a whole stack of stuff to that, but that's the raw material. That in Paul's understanding, the followers of Jesus would be a gift to the community from which they are part. We would add wisdom, beauty, honesty, help, health. We would be like salt and like light. Who said that? Friends, if you could somehow cruelly go to some small village in Israel in the first century and steal away all their elders, the community would grieve, not only for the loss of men they love, they would grieve because they would not know how to be a decent, kind, good village without the influence of that ecclesia. Now I challenge you with this question. Could your church be taken away from your neighborhood, from your city, from your village, and would anybody notice? Is anybody in your village giving thanks that you, the ecclesia, are there? How would we be wise without the followers of Jesus in our midst? How would we be good without the followers of Jesus in our midst? How would we know how to be society if it were not for those called out ones, the repositories of God's wisdom, God's goodness, and God's kindness? When I planted the church of which I'm part, a woman gave me a word of knowledge, a prophecy over what... uh, what was about to happen. Now, I've had lots of prophecies given to me. They usually involve uh, waterfalls and butterflies and eagles and things like that. So I was ready for it. But on this occasion, she said to me, a day will come where if your faith community was taken away from your neighborhood, they would grieve for their loss. Now, folks, we are not there. I don't hold on to the hope that we would have the best worship in the city, the best building, the best preaching, the best youth ministry, the best yada, yada, yada. I hold on with hope that one day our neighborhood would grieve at the thought that we might be taken away. You are God's gift to the people around you. And most of them don't even know what goes on in your building. They have no relationship to you. They never meet you. All your best friends are other Christians. All your old friends are Christians from other churches. But we have been leached, (laughs) drawn out of our neighborhoods. We don't play with them. We don't laugh with them. We don't drink with them let alone add wisdom and grace and peace to them. Missional thinkers see God as the Missio Dei and they see the church as the Participatio Christi. What is Christ doing in your city? What is Christ doing in your neighbourhood? How is wisdom and grace and beauty and mercy and peace and love, how is it emerging in your neighbourhood? Your job is to go as the sent ones and to fan it into flame. Your job is to feed it, to engage it, to draw it out more and more. Do you remember when Jesus' mates go to him and they speak to him about uh, you, you know, whether, whether people uh, can, can be doing ministry in Jesus' name? You know, don't, don't, don't worry about it. It says if they're not for us, they're, if they're not against us, they're for us. He tells them a parable about a field in which wheat has been planted and weeds are growing up. You familiar with this story? A few nods. 
You can make Presbyterians do anything. There's weeds growing up among the wheat. And Jesus says to them, they all know what rural life is like. So Jesus says to them, would you go out there with a little trowel and would you weed all the weeds out of your paddock full of wheat? And you could almost imagine them all rolling around laughing, can't you? Like, we would go out, wasn't Dave telling us a gardening story before? We would go out, we'd kind of spray things, little weeds so they die, we'd dig them out, because there's one here and there's one there. But if you have a whole field full of wheat, I come from wheat country, I'm from Australia. If you've got a, a whole paddock as big as Texas full of wheat, you're not going to go around and, and get rid of the weeds. What does Jesus say? Oh, it'll grow, the weeds will be growing there too. Your job, though, would be to feed the wheat. Your job would be to ensure that the wheat continues to grow. And on harvest day, the Missio Day will take care of it, burning up that which is useless and using that which has been his kingdom work. Do you follow? Go, go, go where Jesus is. Go and find them. Serve them. Add value to your neighbourhood. Not long after we planted our church, uh, there was a, we noticed there was a Baptist church in town that had 20 members and the average age was 86. So I just got this real word from the Lord that they were not long for this world as a church. <laughs> so I went to them and I, I said to them, look, I, you know, I know that you know, your, your, your average age is 86. There's not many of you. You've been in decline for now a very long time. But I have got a plan. They said, tell us what it is. I said, uh, you give us your building, and, and that's the plan. <laughs> and we will love you, and we will take care of you, and we will look after you, but man, this would make a fantastic art gallery, and there's a basement, it could be a studio, and the place next door could become a therapy centre, and we could run children's programs down here. So I'd like to tell you, that they fell on their faces in repentance and just signed the deeds over to us. But it took about a year of uh, just going back every so often. I think when the organist passed away, that was the final straw for them. <laughs> so we went into this building. It was built in 1917, and we gutted it. And we threw the doors open. We've given that building effectively back to our community. It's now used by all sorts of community groups. It's a, a business, an art gallery that, that is permanently in the sanctuary area, but it's used by musical groups and by forums and neighbourhood gatherings of all kinds. When we first opened the doors and the windows and were throwing enormously huge amounts of material out, neighbours would come and say, do you mind if I have a look inside? And we'd say, no, no, come in. And they would walk in like this. And they'd say, it's beautiful in here. Because it is actually a very beautiful building. It's beautiful in here. I've never been in here before. I said, so you're, you're like new to the street? You've just moved in? No, I've been here 17 years. And that building is a complete and utter mystery to me. This is not the ecclesia, is it? This is, as Dave said before, people sitting on the sidelines and asking questions like, who will love us? Who will care for us? Who will minister to us? When all along, the Missio Dei was demanding of them that they say, whom can we serve? And whom can we love? And to whom can we go? You'll see God differently. He's the Missio Dei. You'll see church differently. It's participatio Christi. And will we worship? Sure we will. And will we build fellowship or community? Absolutely. And should there be leadership? Unquestionably. Will it look necessarily the way it does now, given the constraints of following Christ into this world? I think it will look different. But it is just as indispensable in missional thinking. So don't get all nervous on me, like I want to burn your church building down. I do, but don't get nervous about that. <laughs> The third thing is this, you will see the world differently. 
too much mainstream church thinking has been, how wonderful it is in here and how icky it is out there. There's a song some churches sing, better a, a day in the house of the Lord than a thousand out there when it's all yucky and nasty. Whenever you sing it, I say, well, look, go back to Jerusalem if that's what you want. But the house of the Lord is here. And you're right, better a day in the house of the Lord? Absolutely. But my friends, the world out there is not as dreadful and vile as Christians like to make out. And the world in here is not so blessed and beautiful as Christians like to make out. There's wheat and there's weeds in the church and outside the church. I want you to go forth and to see that the people so-called out there, their marriages fail at the same rate that your marriages fail. They fail at various aspects of life at the same rate that you do. But folks, we share in a common, broken humanity with all people. If we're going to believe in the Missio Dei, if we're going to believe in the Participatio Christi, then thirdly, we need to believe in the Imago Dei, that every person bears the image of God, broken, in some cases very broken. But just as CSI teaches us, the first law of forensics is this, every single point of contact leaves a trace. And because the human soul has been in contact with the living God. He has left a trace. He has left his fingerprints on their souls. I'm sick of going to weddings where people talk about because these two are Christian, we can be guaranteed of blah, blah, blah. I'm sick of the myths and the legends that we make up. I've met good honest, true, kind people outside the church and evil and despicable and horrible people inside the church. Can we forget about the boundaries then and just recognise it's all one wheat field in which wheat and weeds are all growing up? I now go forth on the fundamental assumption that every person I meet will in some way reflect the image of God and it's my job to find it and to tease it out so that they, recognising their connection with God, might come to want to know his son. I was in Pittsburgh a while ago and they said to me, uh, yeah, look, that's easy, that's easy for you to say. Like, maybe Sydney is different. Like, it's very hard to meet people in this town. It's not that friendly. You know, the bars and places are very seedy and nasty places. Not, not, it's very difficult. It's not as easy as you say. I said, listen, you live in Pittsburgh. I'm not going to tell you what Pittsburgh is like. It's like, okay, I'll take your word for it. It's really hard. After the session, that, that night, uh, we go down to a bar. I'm an Australian, so we were having a lemonade down there <laughs> and I'm at the bar ordering a drink and this woman sort of bumps into me oh I'm sorry I'm sorry I'm sorry she says I said it's okay it's okay uh, she said I'm just like I'm really excited she said this is because I'm I'm leaving I'm leaving Pittsburgh I'm moving to San Diego now I've been to Pittsburgh and San Diego so I know why you would be happy about that right <laughs> I'm leaving Pittsburgh, I'm moving to San Diego, this is my farewell party. I said, well, what's taking you to San Diego then? She said, well, the best reason. She said, I'm in love. I said, good for you. She said, yeah, I've fallen in love with a guy from San Diego. Come here, come here. And she invites this guy, I'm introduced to the guy. Congratulations, I say, you look like you've got a good one there. Oh, yeah. He said, come and join us, come and join us. We're all, we're all you know, they're all farewelling us as we go off to, to San Diego. I spent the night farewelling Rhonda <laughs> in her move to San Diego. See, sometimes the things that the church tells you are really hard is only hard because the church ain't never been there. They don't know what's out there. I was in Montreal last winter, last Northern Hemisphere winter. I was uh, speaking at a conference, and the conference, the hotel was on top of the conference center. So the whole 
Uh, I'd flown in, gone to the hotel, and my whole time had literally just been in elevators speaking and going back to my room because I had such a full speaking program. I had a day free in the schedule, and a man who is a, 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 a social worker who works on the streets of Montreal with the homeless came up to me and he said, uh, I've noticed you've been here every day. He said, have you even seen my city of Montreal? I said, no, I haven't. I said, I'd love to. I hear it's a beautiful city. He said, well, I, I love Montreal. I'm a native of this place. I love this city. I would love to show you Montreal. I said, absolutely, show me. I've got the day free. He said, meet me in the lobby. It's like minus 20 out, so like wear your warmest clothes. Now, I'm from Australia, remember? So I came down in my warmest clothes and he said, Okay, I'll just call some friends to get you some warm clothes. <laughs> we borrowed all these things. I was walking like the Michelin tire man, you know. <laughs> we go out, take a, a, a sharp turn, and we're heading four blocks, he says, down to old Montreal. You're going to love it. We get two blocks down, and we meet a young boy standing on a corner outside of Tim Horton's coffee shop, panhandling. It's minus 20. He's a classic 1970s punk. I grew up in the 1970s, I remember this. He had a, a studded black leather jacket that had cracked under the arm and was cracking in various other points, and a thin, worn, black clash T-shirt. He had stovepipe black pants with holes in the knees. He had uh, knee-high studded leather boots with the sole coming away from the upper of a shoe. He had no scarf, no hat. He couldn't have a hat because he had a mohawk that was like this big. I was freezing in my Michelin tire outfit. I can't imagine. His nose was red, raw, and running as we spoke. And my friend Ron gets talking to him and starts telling him, what are you doing here, man? You know, you, you know, you can get a meal at this place and at that place. And he's giving him all the clues on how to survive on the street. And don't be down this street at this time because that's what time the cops come by. Like he's giving him all the good oil on how to survive on the street. He'd just come up from Toronto. I'm standing there and I'm freezing. Like I, I had fears that my ears were going to drop off. I was having visions of Scott of the Antarctic. It was like I said to them, um, I said, listen, we're right outside a, um, a Tim Hortons coffee shop. Is there no way we could like have this conversation inside the coffee shop? Oh, said the kid, no, uh, I can't go in there. So I've been kicked out of there three or four times. He said, if I go in there, they're going to call the cops. Oh, I said, well, yeah, okay, I understand that. But I said, uh, we're paying customers. We'll, we'll go in and we'll have, we'll have coffee. I'll buy you a coffee. Oh, he said, uh, he said no, no. He said, I, I, don't, I don't drink coffee. I said, well, okay, uh, uh, that's all right, you don't drink coffee. But I'll tell you what I'll do, I'll buy you a coffee, I'll just put it down in front of you, and that like pays for you to have the seat to sit in the warm coffee shop. Oh, he said, but I don't drink coffee, so that would be kind of dishonest. <laughs> I said, do you, drink, um, do you drink like hot chocolate? Yeah, I drink hot chocolate. I said, can I buy you a hot chocolate? And he said, I don't really feel like a hot chocolate right now. I said, well, would you consider it an, an ethical barrier if I bought you a hot chocolate since you do drink those and just put that in front of you <laughs> while we sat there? He said, no. He said, I can't see any problem with that. Yeah. <laughs> we go into the coffee shop and Ron continues to tell him how to survive on the street, tell him about his own mission, how he can get a meal where the homeless shelters are. I've got nothing to contribute. I'm just sitting there holding my hot chocolate, trying to thaw out my fingers. As this conversation's going between these two, this kid suddenly turns and looks at me. And he says, who do you think God is? I have to say, this kind of stuff happens to me quite often. And I don't know why. I said to him, I think God is, God is warmth. And God is safety. And God is peace. And God is hope. God is Jesus. And he looked at me and tears welled up in his eyes and he said, well, why the F and na 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 don't all the other evangelists talk about Jesus like that? I said, what makes you think I'm an evangelist? 
He said, you are. <laughs> and I said, what are the, what are, who are these other evangelists? Oh, he said, they come up and down this street here and they play music and they preach with loud hailers and they hand out these brochures about Jesus. I think he meant tracts, but I like brochures about Jesus, don't you? They hand out these brochures about Jesus. He said, I try and read them. He said, they don't even make sense. Like, they're, they're in English, I guess, but they're all about Jehoshaphat, Watcher, Jehoshaphat, and Jehu, and thou's, and thee. I can't even read them. I don't make sense. But what you just described, that makes sense to me. And then the conversation veers back to how to survive on the street. And he gets talking about how he was stealing electricity from a building to put into this little squat that he'd built. He'd built a little platform so the rats could run under him. He was sleeping in this uh, abandoned building when the neighbours found out that he was hooking into their power system and they cut it off. And he said, and I was in that building and I was so cold. He said, I, I burnt the wood that I'd built the platform out of. I burnt everything that I owned virtually. He said, you know, he said, I, I nearly burned all those brochures. I said, what? Yeah, he said, you know all those brochures I was telling you about? He said, I... I was looking at them and thinking, you know, they wouldn't burn for long, but, you know, they'd burn for a little while. And, but, yeah, no, I couldn't bring myself to burn them. I said, you told me you don't understand a word that's in them. He said, no, I don't. But he said, there's just something unburnable about them. My friends, where does that come from? How does this kid who's never set foot in a church in his life know that there's something about the Word of God, even if you can't decipher it, that just can't be burned? Do you follow? One of my favorite books, I'm going to close with this. One of my favorite books is a book called Death Comes for the Archbishop by Willa Cather, written in 1913. And she describes these two Catholic missionaries in the Arizona territories. And an emissary comes from New York to invite or tell one of them that he has to return to New York to become a seminary professor. And that priest, so captivated by the mission to which he's called, so impelled by the Missio Dei, so committed to the Participatio Christi, says, I can't, I have to defy the Archbishop. And the emissary says, give me one reason that I can take back to the archbishop for why you've not returned with me. And this was his reason. Tell the archbishop that down near Tucson, a Pima Indian convert once asked me to go off into the desert with him as he had something to show me. He took me into a place so wild that a man less accustomed to these things might have mistrusted and feared for his life. We descended into a terrifying canyon of black rock and there in the depths of a cave he showed me a golden chalice, vestments and cruets, all the paraphernalia for celebrating mass. His ancestors had hidden these sacred objects there when the mission was sacked by Apaches. He did not know how many generations ago. The secret had been handed down in his family and I was the first priest who had ever come to restore God to his own. To me, that is the situation in a parable. The faith in that wild frontier is like a buried treasure. They guard it, but they do not know how to use it to their soul's salvation. A word, a prayer, a service is all that is needed to free those souls in bondage. Tell the Archbishop that I am covetous of that mission. I desire to be the man who restores these lost children to God. It will be the greatest happiness of my life. Missio Day is sending you out there into the wild frontiers, my friends. The Missio Day is inviting you to participate in what Christ has planted in the depths of their souls. And the Imago Day, 
the belief that every one of them has buried in the deep, dark, black rock canyons of their souls the stuff of faith, just waiting for a word or a prayer or an act of service from you, his sent ones. Are you covetous of that mission? Is that the greatest happiness of your life? Because if it is, it's purified by the Missio Dei, co-opted by the Participatio Christi, motivated by the Imago Dei, you will be prepared to renegotiate every religious Christian rule you have for the purposes of the growth and the extension of the kingdom of the sent and sending God. Do you follow? Let me pray for you. Oh God, have mercy on those of us who have abandoned your calling on our lives, who have not been covetous of the mission of finding your treasure buried in the hearts of every soul, your fingerprints on the spirit of every person. Forgive us for the degree to which we have not looked for the ways in which Jesus is working in this world. And we have dared to claim that we are filled with the Spirit of God, but we have gone nowhere and been sent to no one. Have mercy on us. Renew us, refresh us, and send us for Jesus' sake. Amen.